ocean waves hurl their huge energies onto the beaches of the land in an age-old and everlasting frontier of surf. Land destroys waves, cut short their fantastic, endless journeys around the globe. It isn't difficult to get lyrical about waves. All you have to do is look at them. They entice the imagination. They're astonishingly variable. One day, they're lashing the sea walls, breaking over the promenade, hurling spray over the lighthouse. Next day, they come sighing in over the sand so quickly that little children play about in them. The people have always been fascinated by waves, but oddly enough, very little serious scientific work was done on them until World War II. When the D-Day invasion was being planned, it was realized that not only would success of the landings be dependent on the absence of heavy surf, but that landing craft and equipment would have to be designed to cope with the size of waves normally found on invasion beaches. What was wanted was some new technique for wave prediction. So a group was set up in the Admiralty to study waves, and this group eventually became one of the main research departments in the National Institute of Oceanography near Godalming in Surrey. During the last 20 odd years, work has been going on quietly, and we've asked one of the wave specialists from the National Institute of Oceanography, Lawrence Draper, to tell us where they've got to. 20 years certainly haven't given us all the answers. In fact, we're only just finding out some of the questions. But to start at the beginning, we know that most ocean waves are caused by wind. I say most because there are other waves. Some are seismic sea waves, often called tidal waves. And these are caused by submarine earthquakes or other geological upheavals. And of course, tides are a kind of long wave, which are caused by astronomic forces. And there may also be certain kinds of waves caused by the effect of the Earth rotation itself. But with ordinary waves, we do know enough to be able to predict them from known conditions. To do this, we have to know certain factors. We have to know the strength of the wind, the distance over which it has been blowing, which we call the fetch, and the length of time that the wind has blown. When we have all these, we can consult a chart for wave height predictions. This technique for coastal waters was produced by a former colleague of mine, Professor Derbyshire, from analyses of thousands of wave and wind observations. The wind in knots is plotted vertically, and the fetch, which is the distance over which the wind has blown, is in nautical miles, and plotted horizontally. The dotted lines are the duration in hours for which the wind has blown, and the curved lines are wave heights themselves. So, if we have a wind of 30 knots, which has a fetch of 100 nautical miles, and which has been blowing for 12 hours, we can find from the chart, which is a kind of computer already retina, that the wave height will be about 18 feet. This figure of 18 feet doesn't mean that all the waves will be 18 feet high. Under these conditions, it, it means that perhaps in a 10 minute interval, the most likely hi height of the highest wave we shall see will be about 18 feet. There's more to wave research, however, than just this chart, but perhaps we ought to start with a few definitions. A wave has dimensions. It has length, the distance from crest to crest. It has height, the distance from crest to trough. And it has period, the time it takes for successive crests to pass a given point. In the sea, waves of all kinds are mixed up together. Different wavelengths, different heights, and different periods. In this kind of confusion, the eye can't separate different wave components. Though sometimes you can see longer period waves called swell moving through the shorter ones. If you look carefully, you can often see tiny capillary waves with period of about a tenth of a second, like wrinkles on the longer waves. In a confused sea, trains of waves of all periods are traveling along at speeds related to their wavelengths. Occasionally, two or more trains get in step with each other and all the crests go inside to make a big wave. Of course, they get out of step again and cancel each other out temporarily, so we get short spells of relatively calm sea. This is the explanation of the old sailor's story that the seventh wave is the biggest. Only it isn't always the seventh, it could be the fourth or the fourteenth. We can create this effect in the laboratory in a wave flume by sending along different wave trains of two different periods. Gradually, the crests coincide in bigger waves, then they cancel in a flat patch. 
There's a flat patch. Now they're beginning to coincide. Now a flat patch again. Now coinciding again. At sea, really big waves formed in this way probably caused the recent damage to the Italian ship, the Michelangelo, which was badly battered on her maiden voyage across the North Atlantic. This is a painting of a freak wave estimated at about 100 feet high, and it was seen by Captain George Grant in command of the cargo ship Junior off Cape Hatteras on the east coast of the United States in 1956. The legends of the sea contain many tales of great waves, and probably many unaccountable disasters are due to them. From calculations, we can predict the likelihood of very big waves in any particular ocean, basin, or on any stretch of sea. In British coastal waters, wave heights can vary quite considerably. We estimate wave heights in the Irish Sea, uh, the highest wave which you might see in if you waited for a year, to be at about 30 feet. Between Land's End and the Scilly Isles, it would probably be about 50 feet high, and in the North Sea, between 30 and 40 feet high. And in the North Atlantic, it may be up to 70 or 80 feet. Once in 100 years in the North Atlantic, we may expect a wave of around 100 feet in height. The highest wave we've actually measured, as opposed to estimated, was in the North Atlantic. In 1961, the weather ship Weather Reporter experienced a wave 70 feet high. There's also a Russian stereo photograph showing a wave which appears to be 82 feet in height. There's another area of wave research which has been interesting scientists in recent years, and that's the distance that waves travel. In other words, how far the energy acquired from the wind will take them. Uh, to understand what this is about, one must bear in mind what we were all taught at school, that when a wave travels through the sea, it isn't the water that moves, it's only the wave of energy that makes individual water particles change their paths. A swimmer in the sea, when a wave passes him, moves around with the water particles, and he isn't swept ashore with the wave itself. In 1963, a group of scientists at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, part of the University of California, started out under Professor Monk to see how far waves travel and what happens to their energy. For this elaborate and complex experiment, they wanted an unbroken stretch of water, so they chose the whole Pacific. And in it, they looked for places about 1,000 or 1,500 miles apart, where they could set up stations to measure storm waves created by the big storms in the Antarctic. Their chosen positions were all on this line. It's 10,000 miles long, stretches from Alaska right down to New Zealand. New Zealand was the first location chosen for a wave station. 2,100 miles northeast, the volcanic island of Samoa. Northeast again, 1,600 miles to the uninhabited equatorial atoll of Palmyra. North again in Honolulu, Hawaii, the next station was the headquarters of the expedition. In the North Pacific, there are no islands, so the station was set up on FLIP, the strange-looking research ship called the Floating Instrument Platform, built to float vertically with most of her hull underwater, so that she only moves three inches in a 30-foot sea. The last station was in Alaska, where the waves would end their journey. At the heart of this enormous project was a specially designed instrument, a wave recorder or sensor, which was placed on the sea bottom to record waves passing over it. It consists of a thin tungsten wire mounted between a fixed base and the diaphragm. The wire vibrates, and as the water pressure increases, the diaphragm is depressed then the wire slackens and the frequency of vibration is reduced. By putting the oscillating wire in a magnetic field, a fluctuating current is induced and this electric signal is amplified, transmitted and recorded on tape. From this direct measure of the sea bottom pressure, the wave profile can be calculated. All the expedition's data was put on punch tape for direct input into the computer back at the Scripps Institution in California. The first great storm used by the expedition blew up in the Antarctic in early July, winter in the Southern Hemisphere. 
and the waves spread out in all directions for their long journey across the Pacific. Waiting for them was the wave sensor connected by underwater cable to the newly installed equipment in New Zealand. With practice, the tape code could be read directly and an analysis of the waves plotted on the spot. The interval between one cross and the next is typically about 16 seconds. This is the wave period. By knowing this period, they could predict the travel time of a wave group and estimate its arrival at the next station. The velocity and length of wave groups is determined through the period. Long period waves are fast. Each of these would cross the screen in five seconds. But short period waves are slower. These take twice as long to cover the same distance. However, the velocity of a wave group is different from the velocity of individual waves. On leaving the edge of the wave group, the first wave rapidly dies and is replaced by the second. The wave group advances at half the speed of the individual wave. The group velocity can be determined if the period is known. At New Zealand, the period was measured at 16 seconds. The corresponding group velocity was 27 miles an hour. And in Samoa, it was the wave group that they were interested in. The waves arrived there, as expected, two days later than in New Zealand. The station was run by Professor Monk himself. Like all the other stations, Samoa recorded twice a day for three hours. The measurements showed that the waves had lost some of their energy between New Zealand and Samoa, but plenty of energy remained in them. The waves at Samoa were more regular than at New Zealand, according to Professor Monk's preliminary analysis, because the long period waves, which move fast, had separated from the slower short period waves. This phenomenon is known as dispersion, and it can be seen by throwing a handful of pebbles into a pool. Waves of all shapes and sizes are generated, just as they are in a full-scale storm, and they spread out confusedly in all directions. As they leave the storm area, the waves begin to sort themselves out. The long waves move away fast, the short ones more slowly. Away from the storm, the confused sea becomes a steady swell. And as the distance from the storm increases, the long period waves in front become even more separated from the short period ones. The wave train stretches out more and more. So, the further the group has travelled, the longer it will take to pass a wave station. Taking dispersion into account, it was possible to predict the arrival time of the waves at other stations, and also the duration of the wave train lengthening all the time before the waves beat out the last of their energy on the long beaches of Alaska. Twelve major storms were plotted throughout the summer and the computer in California processed miles of data tapes, a total of 10 million data points. A special presentation had been devised to look at the results. The computer produced a plot of the spectrum of wave data this is a plot of wave energy against wave frequency. The frequency, which of course is related to the wave period, is represented horizontally and the energy is represented vertically. It's easier to see what's happening in a three-dimensional model. Each dark peak is the wave spectrum of a particular recorded period. As time passes, the energy peak moves to the right from the long period waves which arrive first to the short period waves. The whole group took three days to pass this station, in this case Samoa. At Palmyra, 1,200 miles further north, the wave train is even more spread out. It took five days to pass. From station to station, the storm ridges show the wave climate across the entire Pacific Ocean. But the principal aim of the project was to study the attenuation of waves, the decay of their energy. This could be done by comparing the energy of the different storm ridges. Energy was plotted as height. 
they found that the energy of short period waves was reduced quite a bit between New Zealand and Samoa, though not that of the long period waves. But attenuation, or loss of energy, from Samoa all the way north to Alaska was surprisingly small for all periods, or put another way, all frequencies. There was no appreciable loss of energy near the equator. They found that the storm waves from the Antarctic passed without any difficulty through the locally generated waves from tropical storms. The aims and achievements of this project are summed up by its leader, Professor Walter Monk. What we were after was to measure the attenuation of waves as they move away from storm areas. And we chose the best place on Earth to do it, the Pacific Ocean, where there's lots of distance between the generating areas and the shore. Of course, it was always well known that waves become smaller as they travel away from the storm. Our measurements showed that this attenuation was rather smaller than we'd expected. Also, we thought that most of the attenuation would take place as these southern swell would cross the equator and interact with trade wind waves. And this was definitely not the case. In fact, the attenuation in the equator was quite negligible. What was found is that most of the attenuation took place near the storm, the first thousand miles after the waves left the storm. To the extent to which we could determine this problem, it was consistent with recent theories that showed that interacting wave pairs of different scales scatter one another and eventually put waves into a short scale where it's attenuated by white capping. One can be a little more precise about this problem of how the attenuation takes place. This interaction of different wave scales is efficient when the waves are high, and this is of course the place near the storm. It's also largest when the waves themselves subtend a broad angle, when the source subtends a broad angle, as of course it does near the storm. And finally, when the dispersion hasn't yet, has not yet had a chance to really sort out the waves, so they're still in a sort of a confused situation, again, as you find near the storm. Well, so far we've been looking at research into waves in the open sea. And of course, knowing more about this is of considerable importance in designing ships or even drilling platforms for work on the continental shelf. But it's when waves come to land that they raise really serious engineering problems, particularly in an island like this. We have to know the enemy so that we can build adequate defences, harbours, docks, lighthouses, groins. So we need a lot of research into waves when they break. In its ordinary travel, a simple wave train presents this kind of profile, a series of waves of equal height. We can assume that the bottom is over twice the distance between the crests of the waves below the surface. In this situation, the water particles in the wave are describing circular paths, as you can see from this ball of wax in a wave flume. And the deeper it sinks below the surface, the more elliptical the orbits become. When the bottom starts to shoal, uh, to get shallower, the wave is affected and it grows in height, becoming steeper and finally breaks because the water particles can no longer retain their rotary motion and they fly off at a tangent. Just when this happens depends on the ratio of wave height to water depth and this ratio is about three to four so that a three foot high wave will break in water about four feet deep. The longer the wavelength, the more water there is to pile up on the shore. Some of the longest period waves in the sea are, are the seismic waves I mentioned earlier. These are waves caused not by winds, but by earthquakes, and they're called by the Japanese name of tsunami. They can travel very fast, 400 miles an hour or so, uh, and they have very long periods, 20 minutes or more. Although they're nearly undetectable in the sea, they produce this shoaling effect in an exaggerated way and often cause terrible damage. They can arrive out of the blue as a wall of water 30 feet or more high, with, with a colossal force sweeping inland uh, quite a long way. Countries within range of marine earthquakes and volcanoes often suffer great disasters from these waves. <clears throat> this picture was taken of an incoming tsunami in the Hawaiian disaster of the 1st of April, 1946. 
A photographer fled uh, inland ahead of the wave. A few seconds later, the island was inundated. A man stood paralyzed with fright on the waterfront at Hilo, too scared to catch the lines thrown to him by the boat from which this picture was taken. A moment later, he was gone. Well, it's interesting to note that in the last few months, um, evidence has been found by oceanographers analyzing sediments from the bed of the Mediterranean that a catastrophic volcanic explosion on the island of Thera in uh, 1450 BC may have caused a tsunami that first drew back the waters of the Red Sea and let the Israelites escape from Egypt and then surged back to drown the pursuing Egyptians. But uh, let's return to the subject of ordinary storm waves when they break. There's a lot of work going on in this field on the piling up of sand dunes, on the shifting of harbour bars, on the drift of materials. In a laboratory, it isn't too difficult to set up experiments with streams of sand to study how it's moved by water and how sand ripples are formed by waves. These ripples are being filmed at about 30 times normal speed. But in the sea, it isn't at all easy to tell what waves are doing with sand. At the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, a team led by Dr. Zeigler has been taking underwater film of breaking waves to try and find out what's going on. These waves are about 10 seconds apart. Here's, here's another one. This team have set up instruments to measure the water movement at different levels inside waves. And they've also managed to get quite a lot of data on how and how fast ripples and sandbars are formed on the bottom. This kind of work on waves is very important to people like us who've already lost large amounts of coast to the sea over the centuries. For example, at the time of William the Conqueror, there was a royal forest full of game at a place called Eastwood, southeast of Dunwich, near Oldborough. Now, the forest and three quarters of the old town are under the North Sea. One of the most interesting areas to see this kind of thing in action is Dungeness in Kent. It's a kind of natural erosion laboratory. In fact, when you see Dungeness Point, it becomes clear that the whole place isn't so much land as beach. A great expanse of shingle steadily accumulating through the centuries. From the air, you see dark lines marking the stages by which the shingle bank has grown, each one showing the successive deposits of high tides. On the ground, the ridges, most of them covered with a little thatch of coarse grass, reach back to the distant line of houses that were built right down to what was then the shore, just about the end of the First World War. And all the time, the sea is at work, piling up a steady accumulation of new shingle, and it causes expensive problems. The Dungeness lifeboat is in constant danger of being left high and dry. This station was built only 10 years ago, but now a new position is having to be established closer to the shore. in the distance, a deserted hut is all that remains of the original Dungeness lifeboat of 20 years ago. But just round the point, the problem is completely different. Two brand new nuclear power stations, the first of a long projected series of such plants at Dungeness, are close enough to the sea for any erosion of the beach to be, to say the least, of interest. 
As a precaution, additional shingle is being brought to the site. And guess where they're getting it from? That's right, it's coming in trucks from the lifeboat station. Well, you can't always get it right, can you? At any rate, that's a fine example of the opportunities for further research in oceanography. But even apart from erosion effects, we've clearly learned quite a bit about waves in the last 20 years. Of course, we haven't by any means looked at the whole of wave research in this program. But in a curious way, our knowledge rests on very shaky foundations. Although so much work has been done on the results of the transfer of wind energy into waves, nobody has yet been able to work out exactly how the energy is transferred. It isn't an easy problem, and so far mathematicians and hydrodynamicists haven't solved it. I don't think uh, I can do better than leave the last word with one of the world's experts on waves, Professor Monk. Ten years ago, the problem how, of how waves are generated by wind was carefully reviewed, and the conclusion was that we knew nothing about how such generation takes place. Then came two new developments, somebody worked out the way in which pressure gusts sweeping across the sea surface generate waves and another theory was developed of how the wind couples into a existing irregular wave surface and it appeared as if the problem had been essentially solved then we encouraged a student who loved to sail and had a boat in the Bahamas to make some critical measurements and with his little boat his measurements, which served as a PhD thesis, he showed that these two existing theories were entirely inadequate to explain the, the growth of waves. It's a curious situation here that the theory seems to have run away from the observations. So at this time, nothing is known. There is now some development underway of a theory which allows for the turbulence in the atmosphere above the oceans and it would seem as if this theory might have the possibility of leading to the, to the right numbers of wave growth. <laughs>